Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. And greetings and thank you so much once again for tuning into The Stooge Cast. My name is Corey Udler and our very special guest this time around, once again, round two with Bill Cassera, author of Nobody Stooge, Ted Healy, which we talked about at length in our last episode. And this time around, we're going to be talking about his first book, Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy. And uh, Vernon Dent is is one of those characters that uh, you see in all the Stooge movies. And of course, when you see him, you love him. You know that the boys are in trouble. Vernon Dent doesn't take any guff. But the one thing I learned after reading Bill's book was what a career that Vernon Dent had uh, before he worked with Columbia. Uh, Vernon Dent, uh, an absolutely fascinating upbringing, childhood, and uh, and a very fascinating uh, coming up through the ranks in the entertainment business, to find his way to the Stooges and to uh, all the Columbia Shorts. It's uh, remarkable when you really dive into everything that Vernon Dent did in his career. A great man and uh, a great book and a great author, Bill Cassera. And we're going to be talking Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy, his first book. And we're going to get into that in just a moment, right here on the Stooge Cast. Oh, we got it. We got it. You got what? We found a way to put Simon Ice Car Wax and Simon Ice Car Cleaner all in one push-button can. And just how does it work, Professor Nitwit? Come on, we'll show you. Come on, we'll show you. Come on, with. Now look, it squirts on. You push the button. See? See? And then what? You spread it around and let it dry. And it's really Simon Ice, is it? Watch this. Sure, it's Simon Ice. Look at that shine. <whistles> we'll be famous. We'll make a fortune. We'll call it uh, Instant Simon Ice. Instant Simon Ice, you lame brains. You can already buy Instant Simon Ice everywhere. Instant Simon Ice? They thought of it too. Simon Ice thinks of everything. Try Instant Simon Ice, another easy new way to brighten your day from Simon Ice Company. And our very special guest on this episode of the Stooge Cast, once again, we welcome in author Bill Cassera. And Bill, of course, on our last show, uh, took us into the story of Ted Healy, Nobody's Stooge. Now, uh, that one kind of maybe dispelled some of the rumors and myths uh, behind Ted Healy and his relationship with the Three Stooges. But uh, his other book, his first book, Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy, talks about one of our favorite bit players. And I have to say, he's not my favorite bit player for the Stooges. That would be Christine McIntyre. But that's for obvious reasons. Vernon Dent, of course, uh, and and Emil Sitka, all of these guys uh, brought their own brand of comedy to what the Stooges did and also to uh, the entire Columbia Shorts department. And Vernon Dent had a very, very fascinating uh, childhood and a very fascinating upbringing and a very fascinating ascent in the world of entertainment. Now, Bill Cassera, our guest, the book Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy. Bill, thanks for being on the show first. And second of all, uh, going way back into the life of Vernon Dent, uh, he was kind of fighting out of the corner right away uh, in life. Uh, Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, he had a um, he had a, an incredible beginning of show business, and uh, if anyone established themselves in show business, they they usually have an over the top uh, story about their beginnings, and uh, as we all know, sometimes they make it up for um, for attention. And uh, but when I found out Vernon Dent's first step in show business, uh, I couldn't believe he never retold the story in uh, publicity or or uh, any other uh, interviews. And I'll, I'm going to 
divulge it right now. Uh, uh, Vernon was a young guy going to uh, school in San Jose, California, and uh, he got a job at one of the uh, theaters in town uh, doing a, a little bit of everything. Well, during the uh, show, he was in the upper balcony. The, the theater had just opened days before, and he leaned on one of the rails, and it catapulted him. He lost, it, it gave way, and Vernon fell into the orchestra pit and broke his leg. So can you imagine that audience seeing young Vernon Dent, uh, a horrible scene, uh, breaking his leg? And I found out by uh, going through the San Jose newspapers and and acquiring uh, Vernon Dent, and holy cow, that incident popped up to me as a uh, on the tenth page of a horrible accident of a of a young San Jose boy. So that I decided this is an interesting life. I, I want to know more. Uh, I think that was part of my uh, uh, procedure in uh, in figuring out if if he was book worthy or not. Uh, that is a one heck of a start to show business. He's uh, can you imagine all the actors uh, and the showgoers? They they treated him as a trooper, reinforced everything he about the theater itself, and he learned uh, from the bottom rung up to be what he became. And the book not only uh, really tells us the story of of who Vernon Dent is, but it also really paints a picture of. Uh, someone coming up at that time, like how does someone go from potentially singing in a bar to uh, being on the stage to being in Max Sennett movies? And that's the one thing that the book really does a tremendous job on, is not only telling the story of Vernon Dent, but telling the story of entertainment um, at the time. Now, uh, talking about Vernon Dent, of course, we all know him and, and love him with his work with the Stooges. And the one thing that, that struck out that stuck out to me that you had said was when you would see the the opening credits and you'd see Mo Larry Curly, Mo Larry Shem, and you'd see that name Vernon Dent, you knew that uh, the boys weren't going to get too far with this guy because uh, this guy was, (laughs) he was going to be spinning from the word go. Don't aggravate Vernon. (laughs) He was a comic heavy. He established that years before with Max Sennett. And even before that, uh, he uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Vernon starred in his own comedy series in 1921 called The Folly Comedies. Hank Mann discovered him. Uh, he had kind of a fatty Arbuckle persona back then. But uh, once he became more of a stock player for Senate, he was, uh, as we all know, heavy... Um, uh, heavy weight, uh, he became a you know a natural choice for villainy and character acting, and uh, boy, everyone knew once Vernon became available in, um, in 1936, uh, the the people at Columbia hired him to uh, complement their comedy unit. And with Vernon Dent. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people may not know his work with Harry Langdon. Now they were never officially a comedy team, but they did a lot of movies together, and it really seemed like there was a chemistry there. And of course, for the Stooges fans, uh, Harry Langdon's probably not uh, a Stooge fan's first choice in comedy because he's 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 got the uh, the pace of a tortoise with his uh, with his reactions and, and things like that. But it worked really well with with Vernon Dent. What can you kind of tell us a little bit about that uh, relationship between Harry Langdon and Vernon Dent and why were they never officially teamed up as a comedy team? They very well could have been, except that Langdon wasn't going in that direction. He uh, thought of Vernon more as a uh, comedy supplement. 
they weren't, um, you know, they they kind of established what uh, in a couple of their comedies with Senate that looks like a blueprint for what Laurel and Hardy later did. And uh, Langdon's persona, if you talk to Frank Capra, he will tell you that God himself looked out for Harry Langdon. If he was walking underneath a tree, an apple might uh, drop from the tree and just miss his head. And Langdon would look around in wonderment. And uh, so these natural acts that never harmed Langdon and uh, uh, rudimentary as it sounds, that was his uh, green persona. Now, you throw Vernon Dent in there, and he can react to these things. He can uh, take advantage of these things. He was the heavy or comic support. And if you think of uh, Laurel and Hardy later, um, you take that uh, apple tree scenario, that apple misses laurel but it would hit oliver hardy on the head so you get double the laughter it's more rich so it's uh uh langdon might have uh and, and laurel himself he wouldn't have considered a a uh, comedy team until he hit the skids a little bit you have to uh, you have to uh be willing to accept the equal status. And I don't think Langdon considered that until after um, that opportunity had passed. By then, Laurel and Hardy really took hold. And Harry Langdon, actually, uh, th there's a photograph in uh, the book, uh, in the Vernon Ben Stooge heavy book, that uh, he looks just like Stan Laurel. I mean, it's a spitting image. Or does Stan Laurel look like Harry Langdon? Exactly. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> the one that I think really stands out with uh, Harry Langdon at Vernon Dent uh, is uh, His Marriage Wow, uh, where Vernon mm -hmm. uh, plays an escaped lunatic. And and, <laughs> and Vernon really, uh, really does a fantastic uh, job in that one. And you can kind of see some of the uh, controlled madness that uh, he would later bring to some of the Stooge shorts. But that, that one, to me, uh, was a standout. What is, uh, from that silent era, possibly with Harry Langdon or, or others, uh, Max Tennant, and, of course, Vernon Dent worked with every one, and we'll get into that here in a moment, but uh, w which one is your favorite out of all the uh, Harry Langdon and Vernon Dent pictures? That's the easy one. Saturday afternoon. Yeah, that seems to be almost everybody. That's a, that's a comedy classic. Yes, and uh, when I talked before about a blueprint for Laurel and Hardy, take a look at that, and uh, you could probably see it on YouTube or, or um, it's in someone's uh, DVD collection, Senate uh, collection, that uh, that was made, you know, two years before Laurel and Hardy were a team. So, and and uh, Vernon was the overbearing, bad influence best friend. And Langdon was milk toast, and uh, and his wife uh, lorded over him, and they get up with a couple of floozies, and it's it's a, a as you said a comedy masterpiece, and uh, people were watching that, everyone in the business was watching that. And that's one thing people don't probably think of when they think of Vernon Dent; they think of him always there. Uh, supplying that, that, that heavy role for the Stooges, but he was a very influential uh, performer around that time, and even for a time where the, the, the fatty, skinny sort of comedy teams were in vogue, Vernon stood out. Literally. <laughs> Figurative in, uh, in, in every way. Uh, because as a star, he knew what it took to stand out, but it takes uh, – uh, he was employed because he was a team player. You know, think of baseball. Uh, uh, you could be the star, all-star, and then uh, once you get a little older, your, uh, your, your skills might erode a little bit, and, but you might be a terrific pinch hitter or a or, uh, or great influence in the clubhouse. 
I, I like the, the baseball metaphor. Uh, but uh, but Vernon uh, knew his role, and that's why it's so richly performed. He wasn't a, a frustrated actor. I am very sure, uh, from what I've been able to uh, cobble together, that Vernon uh, was a successful uh, fruit orchardist. He had land uh, in Southern California, and he he had a little uh, uh, a little commercial venture. I, I think he was selling uh, sodas and such at uh, one of the uh, outside of Griffith Park. I can't remember where, but uh, he didn't have to depend on uh, stock acting at Columbia for his uh, main livelihood, so he could come and go. And he did, too. That was one thing that I didn't know, was that Vernon Dent worked everywhere. Like we had mentioned, Max Sennett, Hal Roach, um, MGM. He was he was everywhere. What? How was he able to do that? Was it, and, and I guess it's, it either speaks to my ignorance or uh, <laughs> just a lack of knowledge about how the system works, but it seemed like once a studio got somebody that was a solid hand, they did everything to keep them. But Vernon Dent was kind of allowed to, to do a lot of different things, and he did, and he excelled at them all. Yes, yeah, so when he worked for Columbia, he wasn't under uh, a restrictive contract. Oh, he was allowed to work anywhere, and, and that's how the studio system worked. You know, unless it was the main star, uh, you know, they weren't too concerned about uh, him playing another role which you probably wouldn't even recognize because he played a lot of just faces in the crowd. And uh, and he was there for a second or so. Uh, other more memorable, but uh, the man was in over 400 films. He, he probably didn't even know that. <laughs> he probably forgot most of them. He, it was another day at work. So he was in so many uh, silent movies where they made them quickly and uh, uh, produced them uh, ongoing like a, like a machine. Uh, and, of course, uh, once at Columbia, had plenty of work there until he got uh, a little bit older. When, and it's, they could have used him, but uh, he was going blind. So his uh, roles were uh, limited. And making the transition from silent movies to talkies did not seem like it was kind to a lot of big uh, silent film stars. But somebody like Vernon Dent, uh, that voice, you, you, you almost uh, it's almost unsettling when you see him in a, in a uh, silent movie that you can't hear that, that big baritone shouting, yelling, uh, projecting every place. But he seemed to make a, a pretty smooth transition between the two. Yes, uh, absolutely, and uh, the reason for that is Vernon came up in the business as a singer, a professional singer, and a um, a person that uh, would uh, imitate different uh, dialects. Yes, even as a young man in high school, he would perform uh, to uh, the, the the faculty and students and uh, these little comic sketches. And it was always warmly received and encouraged. Uh, and, and you see newspaper mentions of that. So, um, you know, he was influenced by some some big stars. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but Vernon Dent was an usher at uh, a cinema, a theater in Oakland. And he got to see all the big acts come in, and he was influenced mightily by them. Vernon also uh, not only worked with Buster Keaton, uh, but was sought out to uh, to be in Tars and Stripes with Buster Keaton. What can you tell us about the relationship between Vernon Dent and Buster Keaton? Well, Vernon was um, in awe of Buster. He, uh, you know, it goes without saying what what Buster produced up until that point and beyond. And uh, to be uh, personally selected by Buster to support him in the, in the cameraman in the silent era, uh, these weren't just, uh, uh, 
you know, um, essential casting. <laughs> Buster had picked people he was going to share time with on the screen. So uh, Vernon always considered it a, a huge honor, and it's too bad we never got a good interview from Vernon about it. But uh, we do know that from a uh, second party from his uh, wife, Eunice, that was able to relay that information. The Columbia Shorts. Now, something that a lot of people may not know or or, or maybe just don't know where to find them, but an interesting thing is Col- the Columbia Shorts Department, all of these guys, and not Buster Keaton so much, but, but a lot of these guys were there. Harry Langdon, uh, for example, had crossed over. And you would watch those movies, and Christine McIntyre would be in them, or uh, Bud Jameson, or somebody. It was all of these different players in all of these uh, different shorts at, in the Columbia Shorts Department. Um, Vernon, of course, coming over and doing work with the Stooges. Now, did the Three Stooges, do you know if they were able to say, Vernon would be great for this, or Bud Jamison would be great for this. And did, what was the working relationship between the Stooges and Vernon Dent, besides what we saw on screen? I'm not sure if I can answer that question. Uh, I, I could give you opinions, but I don't think any anyone was present to um, record that kind of uh, uh, situation. Uh, I mean, they they may have, Ed Burnt uh, may have been present, but uh, I don't I don't believe the Stooges had much to say about casting because uh, a lot of things were in consideration. He was a stock player, and I'm sure the director uh, Jules White or Preston Black or you know uh, had had the most say about the the casting. So, of course, they would probably write parts with Vernon in mind. Uh, he was not just a uh, a person to show up in the Three Stooges. There was usually a, a very prominent part for him. And because of so much going on with, uh, not just at Columbia, but, you know, for the purposes of what we're talking about at Columbia, so many different shorts, so many different uh, comedy teams, uh, it, they, like you said, they were really grinding these things out and probably not looking at them as having much longevity, much past it's going to play before the A feature, and that will probably be the end of that. Um, do, do you think that, uh, you know, potentially a Vernon Dent, that anybody, I mean, 400 movies, there's no way that he could have slowed down and thought, boy, these Stooges really got something here. Yeah, I get your, I get where you're going on this. Uh, I, Vernon himself would I, I identify um, uh, himself uh, to others as a, a, a Columbia shorts man. Um, we get that from Vernon's widow Eunice. Uh, she she mentioned it once that uh, they were in Canada at a restaurant, and he was recognized by the waiters as the man from Columbia shorts. So, uh, uh, you know, we all like to think he was a special character for Three Stooges, but if anyone's watched any of those uh, Andy Clydes or uh, the Charlie Chase, uh, you know, he's he supports uh, all, the, uh, all the stars during that era. And later on uh, in Vernon Dent's life, uh, he still worked with the Stooges. A lot of uh, the later shorts uh, that he would show up in was archive footage. Um, but the one that, that that stands out that I never knew uh, until I, I read the book was uh, the appearance on the Frank Sinatra show. I didn't realize that was Vernon Dent on there. Yeah, we, we're not supposed to notice. Uh, he was uh, a Stooge for the Stooges. <laughs> And it's a shame, in retrospect, because uh, I could tell you that Vernon would have been able to hold his own singing with Frank Sinatra in that era. He had a, uh, uh, this is probably a good time to mention, that Vernon was so highly thought of uh, with the singing, uh, 
1933, Bing Crosby cast him, uh, or I should say Paramount cast him uh, opposite Bing Crosby in uh, in a movie called Please. It is one of Bing's most famous song, and uh, and it was a real funny character Vernon had. He was uh, he was a competing for the same girl uh, as uh, Bing Crosby had his eyes on. And of course, Bing wins the girl, but uh, but Vernon was uh, fantastic as a as his comic uh, competitor, <laughs> singing in a competition. I, I hope people get to see that. It's a real masterpiece. And that was an interesting part of the book too, when you were talking about uh, Bing Crosby, how he had been a part of a, a singing group, and then uh, they picked him, and he he went off on his own. And uh, they really didn't. Uh, he he really didn't do anything uh, in the movies. He wasn't really able to do much. Yeah, depending on the movie, you know, it, um, uh, it. He wasn't just a singer. He considered himself a comedian by that time. So they had plenty of singers, and he supplemented uh, whenever the need be. Um, and I, I can think of a few educationals with. Harry Langdon, in particular, where he got to sing old-fashioned songs. He's a bartender, and that's what he grew up hearing. And uh, so, if you want a character like that, you got Vernon. Uh, interestingly, there is a movie called Knob Hill where uh, he was in the very first few scenes in a barbershop quartet with. Um, but Jameson and two others, just for a few seconds. So I was watching a uh, a Harry Langdon the other night, and uh, all of a sudden it was it was almost as if I was watching the the Stooges uh, short, and I can't remember the name of it, where uh, they go into town and uh, Blackie is there, and uh, poor Nell, uh, Christine McIntyre, and Curly becomes the sheriff, and da 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 da. But it was the <laughs> the same players. Uh, in that one, just with uh, just with Harry Langdon, very amusing. But all these uh, these characters, these character actors show up, but we all know them. We all say, "Hey, that's uh, Bud Jameson. That's uh, Vernon Dent. We all know him from the Stooges." Yeah, that's part of the fun. Is is uh, these people had lives, and and uh, they had to support themselves and their family. So uh, uh, Bud Jameson, he had a. a he cut commercial records. You know, he came up as a singer as well, and uh, as a film uh, heavy, uh, you know, that's a whole different topic. But um, that's the sort of people that Columbia seemed to uh, gather for their stock company, supporting outstanding uh, actors with a comic bent. And Vernon's work uh, with the Stooges. Of course, we all remember Ache and Every Steak. Um, so, so many great performances from Vernon. The one that, that stands out to me uh, is the one Mo, Larry, and Shemp uh, live above a, a woman who uh, is trying to pull some insurance scam, and Vernon takes the insurance man to uh, to come and, and settle things up. And Shemp and Larry, of course, take offense to him. The interaction between Vernon and Shemp. Shemp's doing his kind of his uh, uh, Joe Paluca, uh, his boxing, his floating like a butterfly, and uh, just Vernon's reaction to everything. And Vernon's pretty quick uh, on the draw when he's uh, when he's fighting with Shemp in that scene. But that's a brilliant piece of of physical comedy all around, and and it's it really goes to show uh, how talented Vernon was in all aspects, and it seemed like he was a chameleon. If he was in this picture with this person, he would play it this way, but he knew if he was with the Stooges, things were going to get rough. That's a, a good uh, description of Vernon, a chameleon. Yeah, he, uh, in that one short you're talking about, uh, I don't think Vernon moved. He no, he, didn't have to. he was face-to-face with Shemp, and Shemp was throwing punches and shuffling his feet and uh, dancing all around. And Vernon would would would, would blast him with blows uh, every opportunity. And it, it's hysterical. And Vernon had this mean, bull-like expression 
that uh, was very menacing that he mm-hmm. utilized in, in that scene. It was just he was outraged that Shemp even tried to provoke him, and he got <laughs> he got what he deserved. <laughs> Come in. How do you do? I'm the new adjuster from the Calamity Insurance Company. How do you do? Oh, so you're the crook that's been holding out on this kid. Everybody knows that you owe a door. Why don't you pay her? She's a cripple. Come on now, start something. I'd like to bop you right in the bean. Knock this off my shoulder. You're looking for trouble? Knock it off. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, adjuster, eh? I knew you was a crook the minute you walked through that door. <laughs> Think I'm afraid of you, eh? Just because you're a big insurance man, huh? If you don't pay her the money that she's got coming to her, I'll... Boy, I'll give it to you good, boy. Shoot one that way, you know? Just shoot one that way. Whoa, boy! What are you gonna do about it? Where is he? Oh, you're getting smart, eh? Oh, a little hard, eh? Oh, a wise guy. So you meant it, eh? Oh! Oh! Oh, cut out oh. this nonsense. Mary, we got work to do. We'll see you later. Come on. Mister, open that door. Get going. All here. right. Oh, come on. Here, come on. There. Where are you going? It's funny because uh, that kind of humor uh, was developed. You know, it wasn't just uh, spur of the moment. It had to be choreographed. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we know that Shemp and Vernon had a special relationship uh, and I, I wish uh, we knew more about it but uh, we were always very touched when um, I think it was Emil Sitka uh, confided in uh, authors uh, Ted Okuda and Ed Watts uh, book about the Columbia shorts where Emil witnessed uh, by then blind Vernon Dent at uh, Shemp's funeral and how touched he was when Vernon reached his hand out to feel Shemp's face. What, what a thing to share. I'm so thankful Emil felt uh, good enough to share. In the book, there's an actual quote uh, that, that, that Larry had, had, uh, had given about Vernon that said, uh, I've had it with this crap. Stop taking his insulin shots. And shortly after that, had gone blind. Um, it seems a very, very sad uh, end. It seems like he came in sad, went out in a, in a sad way, and in between left nothing but laughter. I'm going to give you a bit of a background about that. He became a diabetic, of course, because of his sweet tooth. But why? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, uh, Vernon had a very tough time growing up. His father was murdered, yes, murdered in the streets of San Jose, where he was born. And uh, uh, alcohol had a lot to do with that uh, incident. And uh, Vernon's mother made him swear on his father's grave that he would never touch alcohol. Swear on his grave. So... All those years that Vernon sang at the bar, all that he was never imbibing liquor. So he, you know, his uh, his vice was eating sweets, and his body started craving, and it, you know, and that's how it starts. But uh, I found out that Vernon was started suffering first symptoms of diabetes as early as 1943. And there wasn't, uh, you know, a, a good prognosis in the long run unless he changed his diet. So he was taking um, insulin at some point. And, uh, you know, as every diabetic would know, taking daily shots wears you down. So he told, um, I, I got this story from a uh a young uh, uh, Three Stooges fan, I won't ma- mention his name, but uh, as, as a young youngster, he would visit Larry at the uh, actor's home, and and Larry told him that very personal story. So we will have that little anecdote for the book, and it humanizes him. 
because you can really see, I mean, just I've had it with this crap. That really uh, does sum it up. I mean, it gives you a, a, a look at where Vernon was at at that time and, and, and what kind of uh, what kind of mindset he had. It was very emphatic, and I think it's very significant. He said it to Larry, and uh, Larry must have been, uh, you know, uh, shocked, uh, and uh, he never forgot it. And and he told it to someone years later. That's some real personal stuff. And gentle presence. We'll, uh, we'll end things on gentle presence. That's what it says uh, on Vernon Dent's headstone um going through the book doing your research on the book what kind of person did you come out of it seeing vernon dent as you know it seems to be a trend where you see villains in movies uh, they really uh enjoy that aspect because they're acting and in real life they're wonderful people <laughs> you know the spread of broad brush I know, but certainly was the case with Vernon. He got to he was an immensely popular person among his fellow actors. He was always a, a willing teammate and uh uh everyone at Columbia they were crushed when Vernon was going through these episodes. Uh, uh, some of the directors came to see him, and and they listed a ball game with him. And when he died, uh, uh, Jules Jules White cried. You know, we we know that. So it had a big impact on people professionally and personally. And I think that's something that we all, uh, as Stooge fans who who grew up with the movies, grew up with Vernon. I think we all uh, looked forward to seeing Vernon. We knew that he was going to blow the top. We knew he wasn't going to take any guff. Uh, but we also knew that without him, uh, the laughs wouldn't be as as many or as loud. And uh, I think we all uh, we all appreciated Vernon Dent. Of course, you uh, writing the book uh, about Vernon Dent and, and, and giving us all a look into who the man was, how he got to be where he was, and of course, you know, a sad uh, beginning and end to his life. But uh, in between left us with a lot, a lot of laughs. And the book is Burn and Dent, Stooge Heavy, from Second Banana to the Three Stooges and other film comedy greats, Bill Cassera. And, of course, the other book uh, it just came out. When did the book come out, the Ted Healy book? December 2014, and people are are just discovering it. And so we hope it, it keeps rolling along. You know, a word of mouth seems to be the... Uh, uh, something that uh, the Stooge fans <laughs> rely on. Uh, this isn't just another Three Stooges book. It's, it's about their founder. And that's the best way we can do it. And, and of course, on social media, uh, Facebook in particular, there are a lot of uh, great uh, communities, uh, Three Stooges uh, fans. Uh, just uh, go on Facebook and, and, and find some of those groups and and get involved. Uh, a lot of great discussions, a lot of rare pictures, and of course, you can find out all about uh, people like Bill Cassera and his books. Nobody Stooge, Ted Healy, uh, brand new from Bear Manor Media, and Bill Cassera. Uh, it's 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 an incredible incredible read, very thorough, and um, it really answers a lot of questions. I think it really uh, is the final word uh, on Ted Healy, and of course, Vernon Dent, Stooge heavy. Uh, Bill Cassera, our guest, go visit BearManorMedia.com and Bill Cassera, C-A-S-S-A-R-A, Bill Cassera.com. And you can get uh, personalized copies of the books, and I urge everyone to please, please uh, go do that right now. Start with the Vernon Dent book and dive yourself into uh, the Ted Healy book, Nobody Stooge from Bill Cassera. Bill, uh, what's up next for you? you got to be uh, working on something else. Uh, I can't divulge at this time. It's it's uh, it, it'll be a little bit different. I'm going to be in a supporting cast this time, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we certainly hope that once uh, you're able to tell us a little bit more about that, you'll come back on the program and you'll do it right here with us. 
Sounds 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 great. And Bill Tessera, our guest, thank you so much for taking uh, so much time to uh, to come on the show, and and uh, really thank you uh, so much for the books. Vernon Dan Stooge Heavy, Nobody Stooge, Ted Healy, beautiful books, wonderfully written. Uh, I'm an amalgamated moron, and I love the books. I wrote these books for people like you, Corey, uh, people that appreciate. So it's it's a wonderful feedback for me. Thank you for having me on. And thank you, Bill Cassera, not only for being on the Stooge cast twice, but for the books. Nobody Stooge, Ted Healy, and Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy, BearManorMedia.com, and of course, BillCassera.com. You can get the books there. Check out Amazon. They're all there, too. And uh, Bill Cassera, really enlightening conversations about uh, Ted Healy, and of course, about Vernon Dent. Now, our uh, next episode uh, will be coming soon. Uh, we don't have a guest lined up, finalized. Uh, we got a lot of people who have said they'd love to be on the show, some great guests. And uh, hopefully uh, soon we can announce that. And when we do, it will be on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash the StoogeCast. So please go there, give it a like. Uh, we keep you updated on everything going on with the Stooge cast, any Stooge news that we have, fun pictures. We just have a really good time uh, on that Facebook page. So go check us out, facebook.com slash the Stooge cast. And before I sign off on this episode, I do want to uh, talk just for a second about a brand new uh, three-disc set that is out from Paul Howard. And of course, Paul Howard is Mo Howard's son. And the set is called Hey Mo, Hey Dad, celebrating 100 years of the Three Stooges. Not only is it nine hours long, brilliant stuff. I currently am only through the first two episodes, about two and a half episodes. Um, but it's remarkable, uh, remarkable stuff. Um, some some things that I'm sure nobody's ever seen before, some pictures and some video and some stories. Uh, from Paul and from the family, of course, uh, Brad Server, uh, our very good friend. I've already seen him pop up on there, and uh, I'm sure I'll see uh, everybody else. Joan Howard uh, is on there, uh, Sandy Howard, uh, everybody, all the whole cast of of characters, the Stooge family, everybody carrying the torch uh, shows up on this set, and I believe you can get it on Amazon. Uh, Target stores have it, Best Buy stores have it. Uh, I'm not sure who else, but if you go online and just uh, go uh, to Google and type in uh, Hey Mo, Hey Dad, Stooges DVDs, uh, you can find that under the shopping. But it's really great stuff, and, and not even uh, taking into account all of the memorabilia reproductions that come with it. Um, an original script uh, reproduction of Uncivil Warriors, uh, oh my gosh, a, uh, a Stooges comic, uh, personal letters and poems from Mo, photographs. I, I, I can't even uh, I can't even tell you how wonderful uh, the set is. And one interesting thing uh, is if you check out the set, uh, you'll see kind of Paul Howard's take on Ted Healy. And once you do that, I urge you to go back if you haven't already. And listen to our episode uh, with Bill Cassera, our last episode, where he talks about his book, Nobody Stooge Ted Healy. And it kind of puts a different spin, a different light on it. So still, to this day, uh, Ted Healy is one of the most debated, talked about figures in all of Stoogedom. Uh, but the rest of the set, uh, from what I've seen, absolutely beautiful. Just a, a gorgeous set. Uh, very thorough and, and a must-have. If you're a Stooges fan, and I would assume you are if you're listening to the StoogeCast podcast, um, I can't imagine that you uh, thought you were stumbling onto something else and, well, they're talking about Vernon Dent and the Three Stooges. What the hey, I'll just sit and hang out and listen to this. No, I'm pretty sure you're a Stooge fanatic, like all of us, like myself and like Bill Cassera. And uh, so if you get a chance, I believe the the retail price on it is $20, $22, something like that. Uh, it's worth, uh, it, it's priceless, actually, for, for Stooge fans. And I have barely uh, cracked the, uh, scratched the surface 
uh, on that set. But from Paul Howard, Hey Mo, Hey Dad, celebrating 100 years of the Three Stooges. And I would love, absolutely love, to get Paul Howard on the show to talk about that, to talk about his dad, to talk about his life. Because I always found Paul Howard to be a, a very fascinating figure uh, in all of, uh, of Stoogedom in that he did try to distance himself uh, from his dad being the famous stooge, Mo, and actually would tell people that his dad was a meter reader for the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, <laughs> and he mentions that on the DVD set. Um, and, and now, of course, Paul is, uh, and now he is the flag bearer uh, for Mo and for, uh, for the boys. And I would love to get Paul on the show, so I don't know if Paul is aware of the show or if anybody listening uh, knows Paul but uh, please put him in touch with us. I would love to get him on the show. I've been reaching out for uh, the better part of about a year and a half uh, to have Paul on the show to talk about the set because I had heard about the set when they were doing a Kickstarter campaign. And, of course, I donated. Uh, They didn't meet their goals. C3 Entertainment came in and put the set out. Thank goodness. But uh, haven't uh, been able to uh, touch base with with Paul Howard. So uh, hopefully we can get him on the show to talk about that. In the meantime, of course, thank you, Bill Casera, for being on the program twice. <laughs> First time to talk about his book, Nobody Stooge, Ted Healy, and uh, this time to talk about Vernon Dent, Stooge Heavy. BearManorMedia.com, BillCasera.com, and check out our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash The StoogeCast, and we'll be back soon, very, very soon, with another uh, remarkable guest talking about our favorite knuckleheads, The Three Stooges. Until next time, Nyak nyak, woo woo, and excelsior. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye. What's the matter with you? I'm trying to think, but nothing happens.